thank you for coming out on this blustery, windy night here. I'm going to start by making sure you know a little bit about who I am. Um, I have been in Alaska for the last 40 years, and through an assortment of different positions, I've been working in the field of climate and energy policy, coastal management, fisheries and fish politics. I've worn the hat of being the executive director of United Fishermen of Alaska, which is the largest fishing organization in the state. I've worn the hat of heading up the Alaska Conservation Alliance and Conservation Voters. Been elected twice to public office. Uh, let's see, and I'm a writer. I currently write for the Alaska Dispatch News. I've been a columnist for the last five or six years. This is my first real serious book, and I have written two screenplays. And the screenplays have to touch on climate change as well. So, um, and I'm an adventurer. You're going to discover that part about me in, 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 in the book. So what I'd like to do is talk to you about some hope spots that I have planted in my book. And the book is called The Great Unconformity, which you're going to learn about what that title means. So you're curious, huh? What does that mean? Okay, good, 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 good. Yeah, that, we want that. We want curiosity. Um, and um, in, in the book, I have purposely planted hope spots. And, and I have kind of distilled them into this talk about, you know, 10 points of hope. But the one-line description about what the book is is that it's an adventure memoir that's wrapped up in the global events of sustainability and climate change. So in the book, you're climbing Denali with me. We're running wild rapids. We're kayaking among whales. You get a little bit of that, but, but there's much more adventure in the book. So I have been working on the topic of climate change in Alaska for more than 10 years. And to date, my biggest accomplishment lies with former Governor Sarah Palin. Yeah. It's strange, isn't that? You know, th that would be my biggest accomplishments. But back then, she actually believed in climate change before she became a national politician. And she established a goal of setting 50% renewable energy by 2025. And she didn't put much policy weight behind it, but she got herself out there. And I followed up with legislative action. And this title called Underdog Politics in Palin is one of the chapters in the book. And it, you might think I would be really discouraged if since 2009 when she left office that the state of Alaska has not been engaged in climate change. We are the poster state for climate impacts since we are America's only Arctic region. Um, but we're also the poster state for climate inaction. And a lot of that has to do with uh, the prevailing influence of the oil and gas industry. So Alaska is an interesting place to work from because it's a state of contradictions. We are primarily funded by oil, but we are founded on fish, for example. So one of the things that you need to know about myself is that I am very much informed by nature as well as science and policy. And this is my backyard, the Mendenhall Glacier. And you can see the sudden retreat and loss of ice over 26 years. Uh, it's interesting that Mark Kelly actually staged this photo and has the, you know, the, the tent and the people in all the right spots. Um, and this kind of brings me up to my, my first reading that I, I would like to do from the book. It gives you a sense of why I am so informed by, I'm equally informed by nature. I've been visiting the Menhall Glacier regularly for the last quarter century. And through those years, I've come to think of it as part of my everyday life, a friend of sorts. Like any friend who once visits repeatedly over the years, the Menhall Glacier marks my family memories. Two decades ago, I played on the sandy moraine with my school-aged children. Then the face of the glacier stood near the waterfall. Now it's about a half, but now it's about a mile away, and my children are grown. Not only have I played here, I have prayed here as well. 
I affectionately call the Mendenhall Glacier the Church of the Latter-day Glacier. Listening to a deep blue spear of ice groaning to fall free from the glacier's hold, I prayed for loved ones to be released from terminal illness. Here I can understand the transformation from ice to water, from river to ocean, from life to death, and life again. The glacier, in its largest meaning, comforts me. But as a bold, barren barometer of, of climate change, it very much disturbs me. And um, so it's important to know the context of which I sort of come from when this is my backyard. And now I'm going to lead into why I still have hope. You might think I could be really down in the dumps since the state of Alaska hasn't done anything since Sarah Palin. I keep seeing this rapid retreat. But I do indeed have hope. So before I get into the hope, though, what I want everybody here to do is make sure you have the situational awareness about climate change and where we are today. And I've come up with a really quick way of doing that, which is we're going to count off on our fingers. We have one Earth, right? One. One Earth. Two. Two degrees Celsius, which is the basis of the whole Paris Climate Agreement. This is the benchmark that we cannot exceed if we want to prevent runaway climate change. And three, we have three times more fossil fuels of known reserves that need to stay in the ground if we have any chance of not exceeding the two degrees Celsius. In other words, we don't need to be exploring in the Arctic. You know, there's lots of places we don't need to go. It just needs to stay in the ground. And also the number three kind of corresponds to 350 parts per million. And that's the kind of the ideal range we want to meet for assuring that we have climate swings we can live with, and that's three parts per million of CO2. Number four, if we do nothing and we have business as usual, we will completely consume our carbon budget by 2040. And the other point about four is to know that we are currently at 400 parts per, per million. We are well over that 350 benchmark. And number five, this is where I turn to the audience and ask you, where, just name me five impacts of climate change that you know about that we do nothing. And, and every region in the country can come up easily with five. Flooding. Flood. Fire. Fire, more intense fires, absolutely. That's two, yes. Hurricanes in intensity and frequency. Sea level rise. Sea level rise. Killing fish. Killing fish. Ocean acidification. And, and that is one of the scariest things of all. You know, sort of the evil twin of climate change, if you will. So, this is a pretty dire situational awareness that we have to deal with. And while I am hopeful, I never lose fact, never lose count of these one, two, three, four, five. And we also have barriers to progress. To, there's more than five. These are, there are definitely more than five. But I was just trying to come up with kind of like what I consider some of the five key ones. Dysfunctional Congress, disproportionate influence of big money, as driven by Citizens United. Exxon and the Koch brothers have funded climate denial for the last 10 years, so now all of a sudden science becomes ideological when it shouldn't be at all. Number four, we have stranded assets. We need to, you know, we have three times more fossil fuels than we can possibly burn. It means a lot of these big multinational corporations have to strand their assets. That's something they don't want to do there's going to be tremendous pushback. And number five, it's big and complex. People don't like to f get evidence that makes us feel insecure or confused. I used to put up long-term, that it was a long-term issue. But now that we've had these strings of hurricanes and forest fires, it's no longer long-term. It's, it's, it's here now and intense. All right, so we're getting kind of down. Let's go back to points of hope, all right? So this is not my photo, but I actually did uh, one time when I was really down in the dumps, 
uh, one New Year's Eve, I was talking to Bill, my husband, and I was trying to like, you know, talk about, okay, it's New Year's Eve, we should be looking for positive sign. There was this, you know, God light coming through this, the sun. And, and um, I said, maybe this will be the year things turn around. And, and being ever pragmatic, uh, Bill, my husband, who's graciously here, um, he says, yeah, but that's not going to happen on the environment, not with President Bush's rollbacks and all this sort of stuff. And, and I'm like, come on, come on, go with me here. I'm just looking for hope. And I lifted up, and I saw two whales breaching, you know? And I was like, all right. So I wrote an essay called The Year of Two Whales Breaching. And just as I had finished penning, rewriting that essay, because it's the first chapter in my book, this photo appears on Facebook. You know, so this is a photo taken by my friend Cam, who was another naturalist. So I took it as a very good sign and thought it was a very appropriate picture to, to uh, symbolize my, my points of hope, because you don't see this very often. All right, the first point of hope. In the, number one is there greater awareness that synergy rules. And by that I mean a sound environment and sound economy go hand in hand. When I first came to Alaska in 1977, it was nothing but conflict. You couldn't have economic development and environmental protection at the same time. It was a versus, you know. And, and nowadays, there's much more awareness that it's not a trade-off. If you really want to have a sound economy, you need a sound environment. And, and in fact, um, when you look at current polls uh, nowadays, you'll see that 70% of Americans now believe that you can protect the environment and grow the economy at the same time. And just today, um, a friend of mine sent me a new poll that showed two-thirds of Americans believe we can address climate change and create jobs at the same time. So in other words, the dynamic of the discussion has changed. Instead of conflict, it's synergy. And this has been a big change for me to experience over the years. And here are some recent reports that confirm that. Donald Trump doesn't know that his EPA administration actually released this report while he's been our president that shows that economic growth and environmental rules can coexist. And the second point here that's, that I think is equally significant is we've now had the second year in a row where greenhouse gas emissions on a global level has remained flat, and yet the global economy has grown by 3%. So we now have clearly demonstrated we can go down this path. Number two is, is the millennial generation as our new civic um, generation in America. I don't know if anybody here has read the book, The Millennial Momentum. Probably not, but it's uh, been written by a couple of historians. Hold on. There we are. Uh, Marley Winograd and Michael Haas, who wrote the book, Mill Millennial Momentum. They looked at America's demographic history, and they determined that about every eight decades, coincident with the most stressful and perilous events in US history, including the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, the Great Depression, and World War II, a new positive, accomplished, and group-oriented civic generation emerges to change the course of history and remake America. And the millennial generation is America's new, newest civic generation. They first showed up in 2008 and elected President Obama. They need to show up again and in force. But they are uh, extremely motivated and activated, and in regards to how these trends play out for saving the planet, um, these historians project that the millennial enthusiasm for taking individual action to fulfill collective responsibilities in the marketplace as well as in the voting booth will, I want to emphasize will, tip the scales in favor of pro-green policies at both the national and international level. So I place a lot of hope in the millennial generation. I also place a lot of hope in the rise of women, particularly the rise of women in business. In 2010, for the first time, uh, women became the majority of the American workforce, and over 40% of the managers in, in the US are now women. 
And you would say, well, why is this significant? And polls consistently show that women are more likely than men to rate the environment a high priority. They are more likely to be concerned that the government is not doing enough to protect the environment. This is not to say men don't share these same values, it's just that it's more pre prevalent with women managers. And um, also we see in the business world that women tend to have a more inclusive, community-based vision of what business should be about. When you ask lots of men like, um, what's the purpose of business? They say the purpose of business is business. When you ask women, what's the purpose of business? They say the purpose of business is community. It's a real fundamental difference. And looking globally, um, the Harvard Business Review determined that women entrepreneurs now represent 37% of enterprises globally. So if you imagine all these women using more inclusive ways of thinking to implement new ways of having community-based businesses, it works around the world. And I am a firm believer that as women rise, so does too an awareness about sustainability. We're moving on to our, our, my fourth point of hope, and that is, well, we in the United States have not enacted the climate policy changes that we need to, the rest of the world has. We have Denmark right now on a path to be fossil fuel free by 2050. Um, they have expansive district heating and they have a huge push for electrification and they're, they're well on their goal. Um, Germany is a huge early leader in wind generation and they consistently rate high on all the environment and economic performance list. France is now on a course itself to become the first country to ban all exploration and permit renewals for fossil fuel. In Latin America, solar energy and solar production is now booming. We now have 40 countries in the world that place a price for carbon, which is the most, probably one of the most effective ways to impact climate change and policy is by putting a price for carbon. And then, while we may be lagging and uh, our President Trump has completely um, created a huge opportunity for China to step in and fill the gap. And they intend to do so. China has really pushed the envelope on photovoltaic uh, engineering and they have dropped the price on that. They have a huge commitment to electrify their whole nation. And when China decides to do something, they put it in their five-year plan and it's issued with this decree and it shall happen. So um, we have, uh, President Trump has turned around to make you know, China great again, and particularly you know, on climate change. So, but um, not only um, do we have uh, the rest of the world getting it, but we also have a lot of states and cities that are pushing back on we're still in. Um, the reaction to Trump in the US is also impressive and encouraging. We have 12 states that have committed to reducing CO2 emissions under the US Climate Alliance and another 10 states that have said they will keep to the terms of the Paris Agreement. And we have hundreds of cities that have signed on to the mayor's climate action agenda. So there's been, what's been exciting to see is there's been this equal and opposite pushback um, to his decision to retract out of the Paris Climate Agreement. So I put a great deal of hope in the fact that a lot of other countries are leading the way and our communities are saying we're stepping up and filling the gap. And the next uh, point that I'd like to make, the next point of hope is what I call love of place. And we are seeing that from the indigenous communities that have protested the Dakota pipeline to local ranchers opposing fracking in tennis. In Texas, I play tennis, in Texas, <laughs> that people are standing up for their love of place. And it's, it's creating a huge resistance in what Naomi Klein calls uh, blockadia in her book, This Changes Everything. And then just read a couple of quotes from her assessment. She says, the collective response to the climate crisis is changing from something that primarily takes place in the closed door policy and lobbying meetings into something alive and unpredictable and very much in the streets and mountains and farmers fields and forests. 
The power of this ferocious love is what resource companies and their advocates in government invariably underestimate, precisely because no amount of money can extinguish it. When what is being fought for is an identity, a culture, a beloved place that people are determined to pass on to their grandchildren, there is nothing that companies can, can add as a bargaining chip. So do not uh, underestimate the power of place. And in a, a region where I live, sometimes power of place is represented by an iconic species. And for us, it's salmon. So, you know, if salmon's part of the mix and we're worried about what's going to happen with the salmon for climate change and we're dealing also with large mines and that sort of thing, you push that salmon button and, whoa, there's now a whole community of people that are ready to defend that. And I'm sure that that salmon button works pretty well here in the Pacific Northwest. So let's not underestimate love of place. Yeah. All right. All right. Number six on my list is alternative consumer is consumerism is rising. We are a community, we are a consumer society. So what we do and how we purchase products makes a huge difference. Right now, we have over 458 different types of eco labels. That's from organic to the local war movement to sustainable fishery, sustainable forestry. And these labels span over 195 countries. So we're, we can make a huge difference through our pocketbook. And the, the more that we practice purchasing green, ultimately the better it's gonna pay off for uh, the, the, the climate. So I, I, I firmly believe that uh, you can do a lot with your wallet. I had the opportunity to work for the Marine Stewardship Council, and, which was the first um, sustainable f uh, eco-label for wild fisheries and was able to see on the ground w the difference it was making to those fishermen and how they were conducting their harvest and wanting to have that special niche, wanting to break out and do things the right way. They just wanted to get a better price for it, you know, and dangling out that slightly better increase in price was a huge incentive for them to change their fisheries practices. Number seven here. And, um, this is one of the most important changes is dealing with grid parity of renewable energy. And why do I pair it with this particular picture of bubble feeding whales? It's because both are transformative. And let me first explain to you what um, grid parity I is all about. So um, grid parity means that renewable energy, specifically wind and solar, is now cost competitive at the utility level with coal and natural gas, despite still having subsidies for fossil fuels. And this is happening across many parts of the US. So grid, grid parity of wind, and particularly solar, is a significant accomplishment. And it, it, it's happening at a, at a time and earlier than we ever thought it would occur. And as noted by Al Gore, it's the difference between ice and water. It's the difference between markets that are frozen up and liquid flows of capitals into new opportunities for investment. When you think about grid parity, it's important to know that enough raw energy reaches the earth from the sun in one hour to equal all of the energy used by the entire world. And where most of the world's people live and most of the growth in energy is occurring, Photovoltaic electricity is not so much displacing carbon-based energy as much as it is leapfrogging it all together. Yeah, so that's 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 tremendous. And and let me get, go back to go back one to the whale picture so I can just explain something about why I decided to um, put this image with it. And and that is because when I first came to to Juno, it was very rare to see whales bubble fleeting feeding, and this is a cooperative feeding. Do most people know what bubble feeding is? Okay, let me give you the quick explanation. And um, so what will happen is, is one whale may, sp may spot, you know, a huge mass, a ball of herring, and he'll click and signal to other whales, and then they will encircle, they kind of start to gather, and in synchrony they will dive down one after the other, and as they dive down, they release bubbles. And those bubbles form a net, essentially, because the heron are too spooked to swim through the bubbles. They won't go there, right? So, so 
then on hearing a click, all these whales will turn in unison and come up thrashing through the system. And um, I'm going to give you another short reading that kind of explains to you a little bit about why I think bubble feeding is the right appropriate image for grid parity. Upon hearing the click, the whales turn in unison to rise rapidly through the netted herring with their accordion-like mouth in full extension. Suddenly on the surface, gulls and terns coalesce from every direction and swoop down toward the water as the ocean erupts with the heads of lunge-feeding whales. In the center, the lead humpback shoots above the other heads, eight feet out of the water, mouth agape. See that lead humpback right there? Yeah. The whales thrash about, lunge feeding in one of the Earth's most impressive predatory frenzies. The high pier screams of the gulls accentuate the thrill of capture. Sea lions frolic in the wake of plenty. It is truly a sight of boundless bounty and adaptation. While other whales also use bubbles as barriers to corral fish, nowhere else in the world do whales execute this high level of organized feeding. When I first moved to Juneau in 1992, the notion of whales bubba feeding was brand new. To actually see it happening was rare. Now it is a common sight during the summer months, and there are tales of even larger groups of whales bubba feeding in entirely new locations, such as Prince William Sound, 450 miles away. It has taken only a couple of decades for the first few whales that discovered this technique to pass on their knowledge to other whales. Through intelligence and cooperation, these bubble feeding whales are charting new paths to survival, and we can and must do the same. And we are doing the same primarily with the in tremendous increase in solar energy throughout the world. Back when we started first thinking about climate change and what we needed to do, the scientists all got together and they thought, you know, if we could have one gigawatt a year in solar energy, that would be really, really good. Well, in, in 2010, we exceeded that by 17 times. And in 2017, we've now exceeded it by 58 times, the projection. So we are, we are, we are moving up that, that curve exponentially. And, I, and so in, essentially, in many places in the world, we are leapfrogging natural gas. India is decided to go straight from coal to solar. Let's forget the natural gas step in between. And, and that's tremendously exciting and positive. Okay, number, we are number eight in the list here. And this is a disinvestment campaign, which first started on college campuses in about the year 2010. Um, and it has caught on throughout not only the campuses, but through other pension funds and institutions. And now in uh, the year of 2016, we have a total of 688 institutions and 58,000 individuals representing $5.5 trillion in assets worldwide that are divesting from fossil fuels and reinvesting in renewable energy. And this is the fastest growing disinvestment movement in history. And it's the way we push back on having to need three times those more fossil fuels in the ground. And as Naomi Klein says, and I agree, that no tactic in the climate wars has resonated more powerfully than the disinvestment campaign. So another place where the, your wallet makes a huge difference. Number nine on my list of points of hope is the world religions. We have every faith across the world, from Islam to Buddhism, from Hindu to Christianity, all major faiths of the world have issued declarations of need to address climate change. And the degree of unity on this global issue is unprecedented. We have not ever seen all the faiths come together and pronounce, we need to take care of our common home. Pope Francis is probably one of the best leaders. He has written a whole encyclical about our care for common home and the message for hope. Um, when I um, talked, started off in this talk in the very beginning, I mentioned my work with Sarah Palin. Guess how I, how I got her to pay attention to climate change? I gave her a petition signed by 11 evangelical ministers about taking care of the Garden of Eden. You know, she woke up to that. 
Um, so it's a very powerful message because it gets to our moral obligation that we all have to do. And when you have this degree of unity among the world's faiths, I, I, find, I place a lot of hope there. And I want to uh, take a little moment here. Um, we have, you know, where Pope Francis talks about our joy of hope. I just want to give us a little uh, indulgence here while I set up the next, my last point with a little story. As you can see here, this is, this is, this is the Grand Canyon. And um, about three years ago, I had the unique opportunity of being asked on the spur of the moment, do I want to part go on a 27-day raft trip down the Grand Canyon in the middle of November to do all, you know, 228 miles uh, in a pristine time and environment where you see absolutely nobody on the river. I mean, to spend 27 days in this environment with nobody else was just unbelievable. And as you can see by these images, there's, there's no place on Earth that lays out time like the Grand Canyon. Right? You've got like a billion years there representing in the strata of the Earth. And as you're floating down, you kind of like can feel pretty insignificant when you think about the layers of time, the tablets of time that you're looking year at, day after day. But you're also inspired by the awe of it all. And I find myself kind of trying to wrestle with that kind of dichotomy. And I, I did this trip with a lot of young people. I was, I was the old lady on the group. Uh, but these young, young people, they got me to do things on this river trip that I never would have done otherwise. You know, I was in my inflatable kayak and I was running, I was running through rapids by myself in the kayak over curls and everything and, and popping up just fine. And, you know, they took me into slot canyons, into the veins of the architecture of the Grand Canyon that I would never go in at all without them. So I, I, I got a lot of support by the bravado of, of the young people. And in return, what I did was provide them a little bit about the geological history of the Grand Canyon. You know, they were all into the, the, the fun and games and I was into where I was at. Um, so I wanted to tell them a little bit about what the great unconformity was. So geologically speaking, the Great Unconformity, the name of the book, is where you have the deep brown tapete sandstone. So the tapete sandstone is 500 million years old, and it sits directly on, po on top of the Vishnu Shias, the oldest rock in the canyon at 1.6 billion years old. This results in a time gap of 1.1 billion years within the rock layers. And the Great Unconformity can be seen in the Blacktail Canyon, a short hike from the river's edge. And hiking along the gravelly bottom, I was the first to find the light-colored tapete sandstone layer. We followed this layer of sandstone around a bend and soon spotted the dark rose-colored Vishnu Schist layer. By placing one hand on the curvy tapete sandstone and another hand on the Vishnu Schist, I literally spanned 1.1 billion years between my hands. The existence of modern man probably measures a mere one foot in this intense landscape of time but it is our consciousness that gives rise to the measurement of time. And holding a quarter of the age of the earth in my hands, I now found the canyon's landscape less intimidating. The conflict of simultaneously feeling immense awe and complete insignificance seemed to evaporate, replaced by a sense of interconnectedness to the world at large. Bill Plot Plotkin, a cultural psychologist, wilderness guide, and author of Nature and the Human Soul says, your soul is of the world. And like a whirlpool in a river, a wave in the ocean, or a branch in a flame of fire. In a land revealed by time, I have reconnected to the soul of the world, and it matters. This is what I felt when alone in the sunlit depths of the Grand Canyon. I believe the soul of the world can still affect the outcome. That's what these walls of eons were telling me. At the very top of these walls lies a thin layer of loose rock that represents the Anthropocene era. The Anthropocene era is a term that geologists use to represent the imprint of man all 250,000 years of our collective existence since Homo sapiens evolved on planet Earth. When we ponder the imprint of modern mankind as represented by today's 7.3 billion people, all seeking a middle class lifestyle, the disruption of habitat, the extinction of 200 species a year, the ability to pollute, 
to a level capable of altering weather and patterns and acidifying the world's ocean, we see clearly that mankind is an evolutionary force. Instead of being a species forever evolving through the forces of nature, we are now the sole species forcing nature to evolve on our terms. This is the other great unconformity. It too is missing from these walls, not because the river has eroded it away, but because its time span is too short to be noted in, the, in these layers. It is my hope, my belief, that the great awareness unconformity of mankind, the one that can hold a billion years between their hands, the one that is part of the global mind, the global consciousness, wins out in the end over the great disruptive unconformity. Let the soul of the world redefine the Athpercene era in this way. This is my canyon dream. Okay, so we are an evolutionary force and I really do believe in the great awareness on conformity. And I believe that creativity is the equal and opposite evolutionary force. Um, the, we experience more innovation in one year than the pharaohs did in 100 years. Creativity breeds creativity. I put up here just three examples of some of the cutting edge technology that we are on we are about to achieve creating artificial photosynthesis and producing um, fuel from leaves. Uh, we have Tesla's pioneering batteries so that uh, we, we are firing the whole island of Kauai right now on, on solar power during the day and now the batteries are providing that electricity through the night. Tesla is working on having solar panels on top of our cars, on, on our electrical vehicles. Um, we have the little country of, of Belgium, which is feeding a big portion of the world through their intense greenhouse, uh, greenhouse agricultural programs. There's not a day that goes by that I don't encounter some new, incredible, technological, creative ingenuity that's out there. And the, the best hope for proving that crea creativity is an evolutionary force is, thank you, is this book by Paul Hawkins. It's called Drawdown. And what he did is he, he brought in over 200 researchers and scientists to model about 100 creative ideas to reduce CO2, to, to begin to draw down the carbon dioxide in the air that we are, we are emitting. And they did a calculation, and, and it shows how many gigatons of CO2 each one of these 100 creative ideas can reduce. Essentially, it, it is the blueprint for the millennial generation to take up creativity. Um, it's, it's a phenomenal piece of, uh, of work. Uh, and, and it's also very practical. I was surprised when I got in, into reading this book. What, what's the number one thing we can do to draw down CO2? Anybody want to take a guess? Don't eat, meat. Don't eat meat. It's a big one. That's a big one. Yeah. No. No, but number one is refrigeration management. All those air conditioners that we use and the hydrochlorofluorocarbons, and because that's a highly potent greenhouse gas, like a thousand times more potent than CO2. Yeah. So how we just, and now we have a lot of the world, as the world's heating up, we're using more and more air conditionings throughout the whole Central America and South America and all those things. So how we dispose of that refrigerant is, is, is huge. And, and, and remember when I told you that, oh, maybe I didn't tell you this. So we have two degrees of Celsius is what we have to avoid. And we, we've already increased by 0.7 degrees Celsius. You know, so we're, we're ratcheting it up there. But this one activity itself would reduce the temperatures 0.5 degrees Celsius. It's phenomenal. I mean, I never would have thought about that, that that was going to be the first and the biggest thing we could do. Number six on the list, educate girls. Yeah, something really practical. Why? Because we, we know that every time we educate young girls in the world, we have four to five less children. And they're making their own choices. So... When, you know, I could get really discouraged, but then when I come across things like this book, Drawdown, it, it really shows to me that creativity is indeed an equal and opposite evolutionary force. 
And that's, that's my hope, and that's my dream that it will become that. It, but at the same time, let's not forget our situational awareness about climate change. You remember the one, two, three, four, five? And know that we are in the most important race against time. And with that, I'd like to say thank you for coming and take questions and things. Yes. Mm -hmm. And is that something that's being addressed, or is it just going rampant? Um, it is going rampant a little bit, um, because as the permafrost thaws, there's more methane that gets released, and methane is about 25 to 28 times more potent than CO2. But in the back of this book, Drawdown, um, there's this guy in Siberia who has determined that re-putting these Icelandic ponies on the tundra would help reduce the methane, <laughs> believe it or not. <laughs> all right, all right, yeah. Normally I carry this around, but it's so heavy. And I really shouldn't be promoting other people's book, but this, this, this is one everybody should really take to heart. And so, and this is like in, uh, under coming attractions. He talks about this, this, this uh, one Siberian man in the Russian tundra that has determined that if you reinstall in these Icelandic ponies, they uh, scrape away the snow. And, and so um, the, the ground remains frozen a little bit longer because it no longer has that snow cover on it. And, and that's one way to help reduce methane release in the Arctic tundra. I mean, who would have thought? Yeah. But if you're scraping away the snow, then you've got a darker thing that's right. the heat. Right, but, but um, what, what this has shown is that uh, these ponies, they do scrape it away, but then the next pony is coming along and scraping a little bit more on top of it, so it still has a dusting of snow that will continue to reflect the sunlight. It's experimental. We don't really know uh, exactly the, what impact this would have. Um, but that's just one kind of approach that I've read about having to deal with methane release. And it, it's, it's, it is very scary because um, I know in, in Alaska, when I hike in the tundra area, you can just see the methane bubbles coming up more and more. Because now we've got methane on those Texas cattle ranches too. Yep. Mm -hmm. Right. So food waste and how we manage our foods. And yeah, yeah. So um, the thing about dealing with climate change is that there, it, it permeates throughout our daily lives and our environment. And there's, there's so many ways that it touches um, the release of CO2. So it also creates more opportunities for us to be part of the solution, you know, if we choose to eat less beef and, and, and go vegetarian. That's a, that makes it, that's a way we as individuals can make a difference on methane. Yep, mm hmm yeah. Under uh, trying to deal with the ozone layer, we did uh, outlaw some of the hydrochlorofluorocarbons, but um, there are still, you know, many countries that still use that refrigerant. But uh, what I, I understand from reading this, the analysis and drawdown is we now have um, some chemistry that can actually, once you take those old units out. So it's, it's not so much putting more, building no, more new ones, but we just have a lot of old air conditioners in there where the, those chlorofluorocarbons are, are present. And when the air conditioning units no longer work, how do we dispose of them? And that's been the whole key question. So that's why it says it's refrigerant management. And we now have some chemistries that can make these car dangerous carbons inert. It's a little bit more expensive, but we now have pioneered the technology to make, make them inert in, the, in our disposal process. I wanted to talk about the enemy a little bit. So, when, <laughs> you know, the thing that people might be not realizing is that uh, oil companies and uh, power uh, electric companies are centralized power structures where, you know, it, you know, they have to build all these transmission lines and all that stuff to give the power to you, and then that, uh, you know, concentrates wealth, right? And so, you know, they like that concentration of wealth. But the thing is that anybody can put 
solar on their house and generate their own industry. And the, and the power companies don't like that because that's going to put them out of business. And so that's something that we're up against that people don't really maybe not think about. So you want to talk about that a little bit? Well, I agree with you. Uh, there's a lot of resistance to trying to promote off-grid uh, self-generation electricity. Uh, but you've, you'll find some pioneering electrical co-ops that are willing to sort of give credit for doing that. Some utilities have discovered that it's actually more economic to them to encourage conservation and to encourage this contribution from individual sites, it's called net metering, than trying to pioneer and build you know, a new hydro dam and whatnot. But remember when I talked in the first part about some of the barriers to progress, and that is the influence of, of large corporations in our, domestic, in our democratic affairs? That, that's still an issue out there. It, that is a barrier we have to try to fight through. But there are examples where people have made inroads and smaller utilities um, are showing that it can be done. And many times, it's, well, that's what it takes. It's the smaller co-ops that kind of pioneer, and then the larger utilities will jump on the bandwagon later. Will they jump on soon enough? That's, a, that's an unknown question. I can't, don't know. Yes? Uh, um, with what happened in Puerto Rico, uh, they had a grid system down there that was almost bankrupt, and now it's destroyed. And it'll take very estimated years to replace it. So I've been talking to every solar company I can reach, and there was a news item just last week. Um, it seems to me that it's a perfect case study for just what's called distributed energy, mm -hmm. which would be to put your renewable solar wind uh, at the hospital, at the communities, and at the various locations to rebuild the need for electricity. Puerto Rico, but unite it on the grid, because eventually everybody needs power. And that's one problem with decentralized um, um, renewable energy and power, is that um, you know the, the utilities have wanted it to be on the grid, mm -hmm. need the grid. And um, so we don't want to leave people out. So that's a, an element of all that. But this shift to renewables is so possible in Puerto Rico and would make such a huge difference for people. Uh, the big news item was Tesla was in there talking to people. So hopefully they'll do a case study. Thank you for bringing that up. I hadn't realized that. Yeah. yeah. Through crisis comes opportunity that we don't realize. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So one of the things you need to realize, and I hope that you will check out the book, is... Um, that I, I firmly believe that if you have some important messages to deliver, to wrap them up in stories, and hopefully they'll stick and inspire. I gave you a little bit of taste of some of the stories, but it's uh, kind of unusual to write a memoir that has uh, 200 footnotes in the back. So there's, it's chock full of information as well. Thank you. So, um so one of the things that comes to mind is when we, when we did all that SOS demonstrations, I remember there was a lot more that was going on with the, the ski industry. And the ski industry realized that they had to come together as well to kind of you know, understand, raise the issue in awareness and be a political player. Um, we had a, I had a family member that came out from the Midwest, from, from uh, Omaha, and we took them out to Chinooks. And I, I love taking them to Schnooks because I can go right behind and walk through the fisherman's terminal and show them all the boats and everything and uh, have a nice discussion about it. it. It seems to me that, you know, we've got a group of individuals which are very understanding of this, primarily on the left part of the political spectrum, right? You know, they understand the, the certainty of the science, right? But the folks that decide elections aren't getting the message. You know, the, the middle 25% to decide whether they're going to go one way or the other. Yes. They don't have that information. Yes. You know, and I'm wondering whether or not that's something that we should be doing within the seafood industry is... is that's you our know, job. You know, it was make... Is, <laughs> yeah, is get, to get the information down to Chinooks. You know, so the folks that are coming out sure. and visiting, they say, here's the issues. That's a good idea. Yeah. 
we tend to address the fishermen, the processors, the, the tribes, the coastal communities that depend on healthy fisheries. And you get in that crowd a group that tends to sit in that 25%. Yeah. They, they tend to be moderate to right in their views, uh, resistant to climate change as a reality, not necessarily 100%. It's, the, it's an information thing. It's not getting the information. It's like, okay, how do you meet people where they are through alternative methods of, of media distribution? Because they're not getting it now, right? And, yeah. and certainly, you know, the seafood industry in general, when yeah. percolating that information throughout all that ch that distribution channel, seems like it's a good opportunity. It is, and, and I mean, I think we, we thought a lot about channels, and um, one of the things that you find is that uh, some people at social media works, uh, some people a flyer in a restaurant works, some people um, you're, you're preaching to the choir, so it almost doesn't matter yeah. whether you talk to them. Um, some people start out saying. I don't want to hear about it. I'm opposed to a car. An example of this is the mayor of Milwaukee. Um, little fishing town, very poor, lots of people fishing with teeth on the streets, lots of storefronts with, with busted windows and, and nothing going on. And you know they got a fish plant that's the biggest employer in town. And the mayor of this town runs a charter fishing operation. And he's a, I think, a blue dog Democrat, probably fair to say. Uh, and we started our conversations. He's, and the reason he was willing to have these conversations, he's known me, I've helped him. We, we have a relationship. I'm someone he doesn't fear. Um, I'm someone he kind of trusts. So he started out saying, carbon price, don't talk to me about carbon price. All that's going to do is screw us. The money's going to get hoovered up by Seattle. We're going to get left gasping on the fumes. That's the reality they think they live. Mm -hmm. Whether they're wrong or right, I don't care. That's what they believe. So we sat down and we worked out, what's it going to take for a policy to work for you and your community? What do you need from this? And he said, I want to be able to buy the watershed, where our water comes from, because it's vulnerable to climate impacts, and it's vulnerable to logging. And if it gets logged, it'll be even more vulnerable. And if we destabilize our water supply, we lose our biggest employer in town that uses a lot of water. That's the thing. That's a, we can't do that. Uh, so he wants to stabilize the water supply. That's a climate resilience issue. It's a big deal for the economy of this town. Uh, he wants to have direct front-end help for people who, who cannot just sell the F-150 and get a bus pass. You know, they, they, it ain't going to work. Um, uh, it, you, they, nor can they afford to get a Tesla. How do we help them take their F-150 and make it more fuel efficient, or get a more efficient pickup truck? It, it, the option to get out of the big truck, pickup truck doesn't fit their lives. So how do we help them be who they are and win? And those are solvable problems. We came up with seven recommendations. He wrote an op-ed and went into the historian across the river. And the last time I talked to Mike was a couple of days ago, a month in after the publication. He said the thing that had a million hits at the Daily Historian newspaper. I mean, I, I, I don't even understand how that works. Uh, but Apparently, people are struggling with that problem. How do I, some schmo who can't become an urban liberal uh, and, and, get a, and get a bus pass and get through, how do I become the solution too? And he, he really took the trouble to work it through. He went through a 180 degree change in view from, I oppose all of this stuff. It's just a way for the cities to screw us. And he, and he became someone who said, if we do this, and it, then we can win. And that, that thesis is welcome, and that kind of voice is welcome in the climate policy shaping debate. The folks trying to do this want voices like him. They don't know how to talk to them, but they want that. You know, and it's, so our job is to build bridges like that. We do that. And it's, you know, it's, it, it's a long road. I had a question for Dave. Can... Oh, yeah, please. Uh, I deal with skeptics in my public talks. And uh, how would you how would you respond to a climate skeptic who would say to you, well, uh, the pH of the water off the coast is so already so acidic and the situation is so variable with winds and everything. Um, I don't believe that the oysters have been affected by any human activity. It's all could be natural. Well, what we do is we actually calculate how much of that enriched water is that's upwelled due to man's contribution and how much is due to natural contribution. What are those numbers about? And well it, it's different for different depth levels. At the surface, most of the enrichment is man's contribution. And at about hundred meters, twenty percent of it is man's contribution. 
So there's a very large scale gradient between the surface and the bottom. But we have the capability of saying exactly what is man's contribution. And we have the capability of saying how much the biological impacts are due to man's contribution. And we have a very clear answer to those kinds of questions. And we do that because we have the best ability to determine what the anthropogenic CO2 is. And by combining the biology and the chemistry together on the crews, we can actually make those relationships too. So I think, I think we're moving quite far along in our scientific area. So when the oysters failed in 2008, you could say that that at least was in part due to human signal. Yep, absolutely. Sure. Excuse me, uh, nothing to do with acidification directly, but I heard on the news recently that there are so many plastics in the ocean now that the oysters, which are filter animals, they're now finding microscopic little bits of plastic in these crustaceans as well, or the mollusks as well. Well, I, suspect, no I suspect that's true. Yeah. yeah. So they, as I said, what we're now looking at is what are the double whammies? Mm -hmm. You know, what, what is the impact of temperature and CO2? Well, we found out for this last go round in 2016, the effect is a double whammy, tremendously a strong impact of temperature and CO2. I suspect that plastic will also be a contributor as well. We have to take a look at all the different stressors and we'll see what their uh, individual but we have the capability of doing that. And uh, Popper Mechanics one time, they said, you have the worst job in the world. Because you are seeing all these organisms dying in front of you. And I have just the opposite opinion. What I know of, from my own experiences is the goodness of human beings. When confronted with major problems, if we see the solutions we generally work to get to those solutions. So like what Richard was saying, what Brad was saying, I believe, I have faith in people who in the right thing as long as we show them how we can get to the right objective that we want. That's what we are all about as human beings. And I'm hoping we make those right decisions.